Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody this evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Highland Church of Christ evening services here this Sunday. I um, do want to make a few announcements. Uh, certainly glad to see any of our visitors that we have with us. If you are visiting, please know that we're very glad to have you with us. We'd like to have you come back at any opportunity that you might have to be able to join us again. Those of you that are joining us by streaming, very glad to have you with us this evening as well. And it's our hope and prayers that you'll be able to be here with us in person so we can get the full enjoyment and benefit of your fellowship. Um, as always, a complete list of the sick and shut can be found in the bulletin. So please be sure to pick those up. Um, do want to make uh, mention of a few of these. Ross Winters, this is Linda Eicher's grandson, is now home recovering from surgery. Uh, please continue to keep him in, in prayers. Also, Johnny Neal is in Harris Southwest um, for possible heart and kidney issues. Uh, so certainly keep uh, Sister Neal in our prayers, uh, asking for no visitors at this time. Um, Kenton Gould, this is Sandy Valance's nephew's son, is getting better and certainly um, passed along the thanks for all the prayers, but we do need to continue to keep him in our prayers also. Uh, Doreen, Doreen Pig, this is a longtime member of the Everman uh, Church of Christ, has suffered a stroke. Uh, they've asked for no visitors at this time. So continue to please keep her in her prayers. Joe uh, Gomez's best friend, Bonnie, uh, has lost her father. So uh, please keep uh, his family in our prayers at the time of loss. Um, also, as mentioned this morning, Xander Teigman, uh, this is a friend of Alice Norman, uh, is having a pretty uh, hard time struggling with cancer. So please keep all these and, and some others in our, in our prayers. Um, visitation team number two uh, met today. Uh, we did not have any visits left over, so appreciate the thanking. Thank you for picking all of those up. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please take your cell phones out and mute them, and turn them off so they're not a disturbance of the uh, worship service. This evening's order of worship, Doug Jones will have the opening prayer. Uh, Josh Decker will be our song leader. Robert Moss will bring the sermon. Uh, communion prayers will be by Willie Baker, and closing prayer will be by Brant Dickey. So and if you now join us as we go to God in prayers, begin our service. Please join with me. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to again assemble for the purpose of worshiping you, for the purpose of having fellowship, for the purpose of growing in our faith, hearing your word proclaimed, being able to talk to you in prayer. As we heard this morning, this is a family of brothers and sisters that gather here. And so we're grateful for each brother and sister that's come together to be able to praise you. We know that you created our physical bodies and it takes everything in that body to work together to function as it should. So if a hand is missing, Father, that body cannot do what it would normally do together. When one of our brothers or sisters is not here with us because of health or whatever, then this body that comes together cannot function fully as it should. So we ask that you bless those whose names have been spoken here today, here this afternoon, that are unable to be with us, that they can heal, that it can be quick, that they can join this body of believers once more to worship you. Be with Robert as he brings us the lesson. Be with us when we gather around the Lord's table this afternoon that we might participate in that he sacrificed it and gave his life and his love for each one of us. Help us to walk on that road that's narrow, neither turning right or left that we don't crucify him once more, but that he, when he comes again, can reward us. In his name we pray, amen.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome this evening. Uh, disclaimer here, sometimes there's songs that come up in our lives that we're not always completely familiar with. It happens to me all the time as well. Tonight, hopefully that's not completely the case, but there are a few, I think, that we haven't sung in a while. Now, this first song, number 82, Come Let Us Sing, the last time we sung it, I felt like, I'm going to be honest here, that I was up here by myself. Now, if I can just get two more people at least humming along with me, that will call it a success. I'm going to take it a little bit slower, and we're going to sing it through twice, and we're going to see how we do. But I really believe it's a good song anyway. So, we've got a couple of uh, one-verse wonders tonight. We're going to sing those through twice. If you don't know it, that's okay. Try to come in on the second time. If you still don't know it, we'll do it again later, and it'll be great. All right, number 82. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, he made it. And his hands, they form the dry land. And his hands, they form the dry land. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, he made it. In his hands they form the dry land. In his hands they form the dry land. Our next song will be number 545. This one should be fairly familiar. 545, I'm going to sing all four verses. Four, only four. That's right. Uh, all four verses of this song. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows on dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He takes Salvation is wonderful. 
to mark the invitation song this evening. That'll be number 252. 252 will be the song of invitation. You can log that away in your brain, and then you'll be ready for when we uh, up and sing that song. Before the lesson, however, we're going to sing number 544, a page back if you're using your book. This is one that I don't think we've sung since I've been here. So this is going to be a fun adventure for everybody, but it's a fairly easy song. It repeats lyrics, and we're going to do it through twice. So don't worry. It's just going to be OK. For those of you that do know this song, I'm looking at you three over here, <laughs> maybe someone back there. Anyone else uh, in there might know it? All right, please sing out. I would appreciate that. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Sur Be seated. <laughs> Maybe he meant he may be seated. Some of us may be standing. <laughs> Surround us, Lord. Beautiful song. A uh, lot of need for that, isn't there? If you think there's not a lot of need for that, then I don't know if you're in a comatose state or what, but uh, uh, we do need it. <clears throat> and tonight's lesson uh, is going to help us to understand how we need the Lord to surround us. Because tonight's lesson is going to deal with something that is common to each of us. All of us in this room tonight have this circumstance. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying we want it. But I am saying that we have it. We possess it. And the one thing that we all possess to some extent or another, in some ways or another, are problems. I won't ask for a raise of hand because I figure it'll be just like it is right now if I were to say, how many of you have never had problems? 
We're familiar with problems, aren't we? Well, tonight we're going to talk about the subject matter of problems and answers. There's one specific area that we're going to consider, consider tonight, give consideration to as far as problems, and then there's one area of answer we're going to look at. Uh, Job tells us in Job chapter 14 and verse 1 that man that is born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. We are born into a world that has problems and difficulties of varying types, degrees, uh, just however you want to say that spectrum is covered with problems. But we have a comfort, and when we talk about answers, there's one answer, and that's Jesus. He's the answer, he's the comfort, he's the stronghold, he's the aid to the problems in life that we deal with. Notice with me in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest which cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now notice this underlined portion. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can draw with confidence. Sometimes these problems, they can weigh sort of heavily, can't they? They can be a serious challenge. But we need to remember the confidence that is there for us to draw before His throne. He's gone through the same problems that we have. Notice what Jesus told His disciples in John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in Me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. So we think about problems and then we think about answers. The answer is Jesus. And we're going to look at, at how it relates to some of these challenges uh, a little bit later on. That will be point number two. Point number one, you know, we, we were told this morning three points make a good sermon. Tonight it's going to be two. Two can make a good one as well sometimes. But um, first of all tonight, I want to consider problems of mankind. Now, obviously, we don't have time to mention all the problems that are possible. Uh, I mean, if we were to sit here and list them, uh, there would need to be someone going around with a pencil sharpener sharpening these little pencils so that we could continue writing that list, wouldn't we? Uh, lots and lots of problems. But we're going to derive some problems tonight uh, going back to the original problem in Genesis chapter 3. Because Genesis chapter 3 lays out for us a, a, a few major problems there that we have to deal with and so, being as we can't cover every problem that is out there, I want to look at these as you look back at the very beginning of man's problems and consider some of those things that took place during that time and then consider uh, the answer to the circumstances. Um, the first problem is man is sinned. That's the first and that is the major problem of our world and it has been since Genesis chapter 3. For when you go back to Genesis chapter 3 you find that uh, Eve sinned and Adam sinned and sin thus entered the, into the world and man embraced sin. But as I've mentioned before when mankind embraced sin he embraced a whole lot more than he had uh, uh, expected. And I continue to press the issue that people who want to blame God for the problems that are going on need to go back to Genesis 3. And they need to study the Bible there and they need to come to an understanding that the problems that we have do not come from God. They come from sin that we have embraced. And so it's a cop-out to try to throw the blame on God somehow for all of our problems and all our difficulties and all our challenges. Choices have consequences. Choices were made in Genesis 3. Notice verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Sin then entered this world. 
and it's never going to leave until the Lord comes again and wipes out all of these created things with a great fervent heat. So we're going to have to be dealing with sin and the embracing of sin for the rest of our lives and the difficulties that come from that. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we find Paul stating, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now this sin uh, separates us from God. It did on that occasion. On that occasion, you know, God had said, In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And people say, Well, no, they lived on past that. You know, they were kicked out of the garden. They lived. No, they died. Now, a, sin, a physical death came as a result, but spiritual death came immediately, and they were separated from God. Isaiah explains to the tribe of Judah why God had to punish them. It's not because God was unable to save, but it was because of their sins. Notice Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, neither his ear dull that he cannot hear, but your iniquities... Now listen to this. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you so that He does not hear. <clears throat> Where does the blame lie? Is it that God cannot save? Absolutely not. God has the power. But when man embraces sin, he separates himself from God. God stays where He is always and will always be. But that wedge of sin comes down and separates. Uh, we used to burn wood years ago. We heated the house with wood. And uh, I had a chainsaw and I cut wood. I had an axe. I had a maul. I had splitting wedges. And when you would take that piece of wood and you sit it on your main uh, base wood there to split it, and you either run that axe down or maybe you run the, the uh, wedge down and drive it in with that maul, what it does is it splits those pieces of wood from each other. Sin is a different wedge, though. Sin doesn't push us this way and push God that way. It's sort of like a one-sided wedge. It goes in and it splits us off from God, but God stays right there. And if we need the salvation of God, we're going to have to come back to God. We're going to have to come back to Him. So this is a major problem that we find here. It's the worst possible problem that man could have ever envisioned in this world, and that is embracing sin. It separates us from God. Because of that spiritual condition, we stand in the position of receiving the wrath of God, and that is because of His justice. It's not because He's bringing His wrath down upon us and we don't deserve it. It's because that's what we embraced when we embraced sin. Despite the many different problems that our media wants to throw in our faces all the time, and some of them very real, the main outstanding problem is sin. But how often do you see that in the media? How often do you see that word in the media? You see, they're so concerned about this, that, and the other, and maybe sometimes a little tangent they want to go on or a premeditated uh, 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 area that they want to go into but you don't hear them talking about sin and that's the greatest problem it's the greatest problem we will ever face in this life the Lord however did not sin notice in 1 Peter 2 21 uh, for you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps who committed no sin neither was any deceit found in his mouth that's why, as we'll see a little later on, part of why he's going to be, an, be the answer. So our number one problem here in Genesis 3 is man is sinned. But another problem that we find in Genesis 3 is man against himself. Have you ever heard the old statement, we are our own worst enemy? That can be very true. We as individuals at times can be our own worst enemy. And that can be a very serious problem. Notice back in Genesis 3, God there, when He went looking for His uh, two human creations, who did He call out for? Adam. 
He called out for Adam. He speaks to the head of the family. He calls to the head of the family. Notice in Genesis 3 and verse 9. Then the Lord God called the man and said unto him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now notice, Adam said he was afraid. We don't have any record or any indication that prior to this point, Adam knew such fear. Think about that. He walked and talked in the garden with God even before a woman was created. And there was that wonderful... I just can't imagine living in paradise here on earth and walking and talking with God. Well, there was no reason for fear. Why would he fear? You know, sometimes people have various fears, phobias, arachnophobia, and, you know, the spiders and all kinds of phobias. Well, Adam lived in the midst of all of these animals. I mean, some of these animals can be very ferocious, but we don't read where there was any fear of them there. In fact, he named them, didn't he? But all of a sudden, he understands and feels fear. He became his own problem there. As we think about that, he says, uh, you know, like I said, he named the animals, he experienced fear. Uh, Jesus, Jesus had to deal with the fear that came in among his disciples. You remember they got on this boat, they went out on the sea there, and this great tempest, this storm came, and, and the Bible says they were afraid. They were afraid for their lives. And what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. I've been out on some water that I guarantee you I couldn't sleep on. I've been out on some water that probably left some nail prints in the, in the seat or the steering wheel on the boat. I understand a little. They were afraid. And Jesus looked at them like, why are you afraid? I mean, I'm in the boat with you. What is possibly going to happen? Another time, they were in a boat again. Seems like they get afraid when they're in a boat. But Jesus came walking on the water and they thought it was a ghost or something and they were afraid. He's like, really? Another time when the Roman soldiers came to uh, lay hands on him, they were afraid. So Jesus had to deal with these disciples that had this fear. But we have many human emotions that we have to deal with. And a lot of those human emotions come about because we embrace sin in Genesis chapter 3. Fear, among others, came along. Now, we also have another matter in Genesis chapter 3, another problem. And that is man against mankind. Not only are we our own worst enemy as individuals sometimes, but we're each other's worst enemy sometimes. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 11, the Lord asked Adam this question. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Well, God asked a question, but it wasn't for God's benefit. He already knew what went on. He knew where they were in the garden. He didn't have to ask where are your call for them. He knew exactly where they were. As so, so many times is the case, God asks questions and does things for our benefit. For we, so that we can learn from it. He already knows the answer, but we need to learn. So Adam answered in chapter 3 and verse 12, The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. <laughs> so what did he do? He passed the buck, didn't he? Well, God, it's that woman you gave me. I kid with Rhonda all the time. I'll say something, well, you know, you caused this or because of this, you did this and so on and so I'm joking with her most of the time. And uh, I tell her, read the fine print on the marriage certificate and you'll see that I'm right on all of these things. And she's learned to just let it run off like water off a duck's back so it really isn't as fun as it used to be. But anyway, he said, that woman, oh, she ate. You know, people always talk about Adam eating of that fruit of that tree, but Eve ate it first, right? Did Adam have responsibility to make his own choice? 
Absolutely. Was he head of the family? Absolutely. But think about when he says this woman, but look what he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Well, now that not only says the woman, but it is an indictment toward God. In other words, God, if you hadn't given me that woman, this would not have happened. You see how we become our own worst enemy sometimes? Here's the first man and woman ever to be created on the face of this earth, and the man is throwing her under the bus. And he has God driving the bus, as it were. Can you imagine that Adam and Eve might not have had too much to say to each other after this event? (laughs) Can you imagine what he went home to? How dare you... Point the finger at me and blame God for making me for this. Uh, We won't even go there. We'll just leave that. I'll leave that for you to consider in the way that you want to. But we have conflict today, don't we? We have conflict in society. We have conflict around the world. I mean, it is an ongoing thing, sadly to say. And because of this conflict, innocent people are losing their lives and destruction wreaks havoc. We have... uh, Uh, The divorce rate is unreal. Collapsing of our school systems in many ways, not because of our good teachers and principals and things, but because of those who are not following good things. Murder going on. One of the greatest extents of murder that's been going on since 1973 that our country has, uh, some in it has upheld, is, is abortion. And it's ran rampant. Thievery. Uh, just all kinds of things. You, you, you think about the murder rates have increased. You think about uh, the home invasions. I mean, you just name it, it's going on. It's mankind against mankind. It started back in the Garden of Eden. You have corporations, you have organizations, you even have churches where people can't get along or won't get along. I say they can't get along, they won't get along, okay? So we have mankind against mankind. One last problem before we get to looking into the answers here is man against his environment. No, I'm not up here promoting anything green, okay? You you can take your own stance where you want to on certain things on that. I'm just looking at something from the Bible here, what the Bible says. Notice this problem, man against his environment. In Genesis 3, beginning with verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise uh, uh, him on the heel. Now, we have a few more verses to go in this. Verse 16, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat it all the days of your life. A little further in verse 18, the last section of this. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will earn bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Do you see the outstretched effects, outstretched effects here of the sin that Adam and Eve were involved in? It didn't, didn't just involve Eve, didn't just involve Adam. It involved Eve because of the pain that, that was uh, cursed upon woman at that time. It involved man because of the curse that set upon him because he was going to have to work by the sweat of his brow and pain and working and, and living. And then if you noticed in the latter part or in the middle of verse 19, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. You're going to die. So consider those three areas. The woman reaped, uh, ben- uh, not benefits, re- reaped uh, the punishment of that. Man did, but then also they were going to die. People say, well, why do we have so many diseases and sicknesses? Go back to Genesis 3. Everything changed on this earth 
when we as mankind embrace sin. You've heard me say that before. If I preach long enough, you'll hear me say it again. Because I basically am sick and tired of people wanting to blame God. I really am. I'm tired of a people, not us in here necessarily, hope not, but you look around society and so many people want to blame God and hold a grudge against God. They need to go back and they need to read the Bible and they need to see where the problem is and why it exists. Our problems with God exist because of sin. Men will have to deal with himself, his inward emotions, his fears, his problems, as long as he lives on the face of this earth. Mankind will have to deal with one another because of uh, the disagreements and the arguments that come about because of not living as God would have us to live. But there are other problems there. We'll deal with weather, pestilence, wars, sickness, and death for the rest of our days. In our lifetime, at least a great deal of the lifetime of all of us in here, there's some has had, had uh, you know, horrible things. But at least for the past, what, 40, 50 years, we have had it fairly well in this country. We've been blessed so greatly. How long will that continue in such a way? We don't know. But things aren't looking too good, are they? They're just not. You know, the wars and, and, and so forth, they're, they're going to continue. But here's a part two of this two-part lesson tonight, and that is, in Christ, we can endure the problems. It's so wonderful to know that when we just take a glancing look at, at these problems here in Genesis 3, that we can say, okay, here are some problems laid out that started with Genesis 3 and mankind's sin. If we just said, okay, here it is, deal with it, and had no answer for it, it would be tough, wouldn't it? That's the reason it's tough for so many people, unfortunately, in this world is because they don't see the answer. They haven't found the answer, don't recognize the answer, or they've denied the answer, and that answer is Jesus. In Christ, we can endure the problems. We know, as John 1.14 says, that He became flesh and dwelt among us. We know, as Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 says, that we are made, that He was made in the likeness of man. So let's consider, first of all, from the answer standpoint, in Christ, mankind is reconciled to God. We talked about sin separating us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But we can be reconciled because Christ came and He put Himself in the situation that we were in. We are in the situation that we receive the wrath of God, but He doesn't because He did no sin. So the wrath of God is, is not against Him. So therefore, He is the key to our peace in dealing with the problems that come our way. Because He overcame every problem and every situation. Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, notice this, through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're trying to find peace in things or our own ideologies or other things, we're going to be a miserable failure. The peace is found in Jesus. We mentioned recently He has become and He is our mediator between God and us. That should be a great comfort and help and source of encouragement for us. He shed His blood on the cross and He became our advocate on our behalf. He became our intercessor. I'm not going to reiterate those things that we looked at last week, but if you were here and you remember those things, we looked at that and we looked how great it is that He's in that position. And so in John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That tells us, though, that there is the avenue to go to the Father, and it's through him. So when we're dealing with problems in our lives, we need to look to Jesus, and, and we need to be able to go through him to be able to have that source. Without going through Jesus, we have no peace. We have no fellowship with God. So many try to fill themselves with many different things in life and, and they neglect the only true solution that is found in Jesus. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 
The word duty, as I mentioned before, is not found there. It is the whole of man. And to me, that makes a big difference. I think, oh, it's my duty. We, sometimes we think about duty. We think about something that uh, we don't want to, but we have to do. But when you say this is a whole of man, that puts everything else out of perspective. This is the whole of man. All the other things come into play to support that whole as far as making a living, as far as taking care of our families, as far as living right and so forth. That all supports that whole, and that is fearing God and keeping His commandments. We can find peace with God and fulfillment for our soul through obedience to His commandments. Not only does the blood of Christ make it possible to find peace with God, but the commandments of God are designed there to give us direction, the proper direction in our life. So many people do not have any proper direction in their life because they don't look to the answer of Jesus. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the call of Jesus. That's what he has to offer in whatever circumstance we find ourselves burdened with. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God that would keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Shame on us. If we ever get the idea that what God asks of us is such an overwhelming burden, do we think it was a burden for Jesus to leave heaven and come to this world? Do we think it was a burden for Jesus to take on a body and live in a body, deity living in a body, to go through that body and receive all the ridicule from his own creation that he created and not retaliate to the point that? He had a mock trial. How many of us would appreciate a trial stacked against us with lies and deception? How many of us would like to go through an unmerciful, inhumane beating to where our flesh or our body was just riddled and ripped and then to die on the cross? For shame that we do ever think that anything that God asks of us is a burden. If we do... We need to change our thinking on God and Christianity. Also, in Christ, we understand better ourselves. We're able to find the answer to sin. We're able to find peace and forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. Jesus but we're able, it helps us to understand ourselves. You know, we looked at that problem. Our solution, as far as, as, far as us being our own worst enemy, is Jesus. You remember the fear that we talked about and the other emotions that came along because of sin? And there are many of them. Uh, Take, for instance, anxiety. That's brought out a lot in today's society, anxiety. Well, if it is elevated in our society, I think there are a lot of contributing factors we could talk about as to why it's there, but it is. Well, how would Jesus overcome this? Uneasiness about life situation being overly worried for a long period of time about things, trying to look at, well, what am I going to do if this and that or the other? And it it can happen to most any of us if we allow it. And we anticipate, what will we do? What will we do in these matters? And Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry, God has control. You look back at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25 and following. Not going to read all of that, don't have time. But you know, Jesus says, take for instance the birds of the field, or the birds of the air. They toil not, you know, God takes care of them, He feeds them. Think of the lilies of the field, God clothes them, makes their beauty there. And then He comes to us and He says, Oh, ye of little faith. If God takes care of the birds and the flowers and the things of this life, we're the pinnacle of His creation. Do you think He's going to take care of the lower things and forget us? His point is, God has control and we need to have the confidence in Him that He is going to help us through even the matters that we're dealing with concerning ourselves, And that can be some hard matters. We can be hard on ourselves, But God says... Let me be in control. It's when a person lives a life apart from God. And I mean apart as in denying God 
or living apart from God in trying to pretend to live as he would have us to do, but not really doing it, then this anxiety and other problems come along. But he is a source of true light, life. We need to trust in him and his uh, uh, provisions. In writing to the Philippians, Paul gave some very important principles in Philippians chapter 4 and verses 4 through 9. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will grant your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He continues in verse 8. Finally, brethren, before we get verse 8, think about something. What do we think on? What does our mind dwell on? Do we dwell on what we saw in the news and the problems and the world situations, what could be coming our way or what's going on within our own nation? Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. God's trying to help us through inspiration to understand, you know, we need to sometimes tweak our mindset. And we need to start thinking and dwelling on these good things because God is in control. And whatever happens as we're faithful to Him, He'll take care of us in the way that He knows best here and especially hereafter. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And we need to do it with thanksgiving. You know, we need to always be thankful to God in every situation because of His blessings and allow the peace of God to be there. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, seeing that His divine power hath granted unto us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Philippians 4 and verse 9, going to have to move along here. Time's gotten away. The things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these, and the God of peace will be with you. One other thing that we find here, uh, as far as the answer, and I don't have time to get into all of it, but in Christ, man becomes a peacemaker. We're in the position that we work to make peace. There are a lot of problems we can have, but we need to be peacemakers. There's strife, there's murder, there's stealing, there's dishonesty, there's jealousness. Jealousy, there's enviousness, uh, and, and all types of things. But he says we need to be a peacemaker as Jesus. He talked about in the Beatitudes, you know, the important things. Matthew 7 and verse 12, you remember that golden rule and everything, therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. However we want to be treated, we need to treat people the same way. Think if everyone did that. Well, everyone's not going to do it. But we should do it as Christians because we are Christians. David said in Psalms 18 and verse 35, Your gentleness makes me great. Jesus tells us, He left us an example that we should follow in His steps. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Notice Matthew 5, 39. I'm just having to go through this quickly without a lot of uh, uh, discussion on it. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whatever, whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. The idea there is not retaliate, not bring vengeance on the other person. Look for the fair and just avenues to be able to handle situations. Uh, Got to stop. Got too much more to, to finish out on these answers, but you're getting the idea, aren't you? That Jesus is the answer to the problems. Uh, in Christ, Mankind endures catastrophe. The things that are set in order, you know, there are, are all types of things that come along in life. If you live on the coast, you have the hurricanes. If you live in the Midwest, you have the tornadoes. If you live in various other areas, you have the floods. And, and people want to say, well, it's getting worse and worse. It doesn't matter how it gets. Jesus is the answer. He is able to help us. When he was talking about he would die and that there would be the destruction of the Jerusalem that would come. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world 
You will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Had to leave out some, maybe another time, another occasion. We can, we can talk about it some more, but I just wanted to look and realize, yes, the problems are there. Go back to Genesis 3, and you can see some points laid out very distinctly of the problems that came because of sin. But then we began to move into the answer, and the answer is Jesus. It always is. And may we look to Him. It's only through Him we can truly survive, truly live with hope of eternal life. I hope this has reminded and encouraged us that, oh yes, the problems are there, and they're not going to go away in this life. But we have the answer. Aren't you glad we don't just have problems? Aren't you glad we have the answers to the problems? Jesus is your answer and my answer. And may we look to Him and truly have the answers applied in our lives. The Lord's invitation is open. If you're not a Christian, you can become one. We can help you through obedience to the gospel and learning that and obeying Jesus. And He can be the answer to your number one problem in your life right now, and that's sin. Your past sins can be washed away as you're baptized into Him. If you're a child of God and there are problems in your life, Jesus is your answer. Maybe you need forgiveness tonight or just prayers for strength and encouragement. Jesus is your answer. And if need be, won't you come to him tonight as we stand and sing. This time has been set aside for those who may wish to take uh, the communion at this time. If you're here, uh, would you please raise your hand? Okay. Uh, do you have the, the um, okay, you have them, okay. Okay. Okay, then let us pray for the loaf. Father, we come thanking you for this day and thanking you for the two wonderful messages we heard today. And Father, we are mindful that Jesus uh, went to the cross for us and uh, he was uh, brutally beaten on our behalf. And we pray, Father, that you will grant us the ability to look within ourselves and imagine the pain and the suffering that he endured for us. And Father, we pray these things in, your, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray for the cup. Fathers, once again, we come before you remembering the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we thank you for allowing him to come to this earth and to uh, allow his uh, precious, sinless blood to be spilled on our behalf. And we pray, Father, that you will grant us the ability again to look within ourselves and, and, and understand that uh, he did this because he loved us. And we pray, Father, that you will grant each of us a desire to be with him and to follow him by obeying the commands he, that he set before us. And these things we pray again in his name. Amen. With the remembrance of the bloodshed that concluded uh, the observation of the Lord's Supper, and again at this time while we gather together, we have the opportunity to contribute to uh, the uh, treasury of the, of the congregation that we may be able to continue to carry out the Lord's work. Let us pray for the contribution. Father, we again come thanking you, and we thank you for the opportunity to live in this country, and Father, we pray that each of us will remember that our ability to go out and uh, earn a living is not found within us, but it's the, that power that you've get, given us. And we pray, Father, that you grant each of us a desire to contribute to the continued building of the kingdom by contributing as liberally as we can. And Father, we pray as well for those that will manage these funds. We pray that you will uh, grant them the ability to Give, uh, distribute these funds in a manner that they will bring the most good. And those that will receive these funds, Father, we pray that you will grant them a heart that will be about, again, sharing the gospel and building the kingdom. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, our final song this evening will be number 249, Firm Foundation. Normally you start with the foundation, but today we're going to end with it. And thank you all for your patience with some of these selections tonight. I appreciate it. You're all doing a great job. All right, so let's stand for this song and the prayer to follow. And this song goes with the chorus first, and then it goes right into the verse 1, back to the chorus, verse 2. You, you all have sung this one before, I'm sure. It'll be great. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty.
Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together tonight for such a good sermon. We thank you for Robert and his ability to preach to us, to bring out the meaning and the help us to understand better your will for us. Father, we pray that you would help us to feel you with us, to feel your strength around us, help us to stand up for you when we see the need to, help us to accomplish your will in our lives. Father, for years now we've gone through a lot of contention in this country and it's getting even worse now. We pray that you would help each of us to see to see that evil is trying to grow more and more power here and to see those evil people with money and with power now and to see what they're doing to try to create more evil to bring forth more of Satan's goals. We pray that you would help us to see those men who are fighting against it, to see them even though they were hidden Help us to see them and to vote for the ones that will do the most good for your cause, that will fight against Satan the most. Father, again, be with each of us as we go forth and help us to be a good example for you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.